Welcome to the No BS Debates with the City Council candidates of District 5. We are your moderators, Chris Ward. And I'm De La Vaca. We want to thank the candidates for coming out to represent their communities. We also want to thank Denver Open Media, the Open Media Foundation, Civic Matters uh, for hosting this event. And lastly, we want to thank you, the audience, for participating in the democratic process. Candidates, the debate rules are as follows. Moderators will ask individual candidates questions on the topic of civil rights and related issues. Candidates will have 1.5 minutes to answer, after which other candidates will have the opportunity to rebut for one minute, and the original uh, candidate will have an opportunity to reply to that rebuttal for one minute. The debate is slated for 50 minutes, and as we draw into the last five to 10 minutes of the debate, we will end debate and move into the lightning round. At that time, candidates will be asked closed-ended questions and you must answer in a concise fashion about your position with either a yes or a no, for or against. Denver City Council District 5 is located in East Central Denver and serves the diverse neighborhoods of Bellevue Hale, Crestmore 1 and 2, East Montclair, Hilltop, Lowry, Mayfair, Mayfair Park, Montclair, South Hilltop, South Park Hill, Windsor Gardens, and Winston Down. All right, uh, first let's take a minute and a half and uh, would you please introduce yourselves? Let's start with our incumbent. Okay, thank you very much. I'm Mary Beth Sussman. Um, I am the incumbent. Uh, I've lived in my neighborhood for about 47 years, been active in the community for about 30 of those years. Um, uh, I believe that our city is built on a few principles. One of them is I believe that um, people of different incomes should be able to live anywhere in our city. Uh, I believe that we need equitable transit so that people can get around the city in a better way and get out of their cars some of the time, I believe, in walkable communities. Um, I also think that the other thing we are built on is small businesses and affordable housing um, throughout our city uh, is what makes our city grow, and I'm feeling very good about all the possibilities that are coming along. Excellent. Thank you very much. Mr. Ruffin. Yes. I'm actually very tired of tiptoeing around the largely unopposed drama that is unfolding in Denver and in our District 5. My name is Steve Replin, and I want to make life better for you and your families in our district. What's the drama I'm talking about? I'm talking about what looks like and I think is runaway development of our precious undeveloped land throughout the city and in our own district. For example, even though this project is not in our district, how could anyone approve the CDOT redevelopment plan on Colorado Boulevard in Arkansas that by everyone's estimate is gonna put at least 11,000 new cars onto Colorado Boulevard per day? I don't get that. Where's the common sense? We've really been fooled by developers into thinking that there's nothing we can do about it, but I believe that is not the case. Part of the process does not take into account traffic counts as part of the zoning and approval process. And when someone comes in for a development plan, as long as, or a proposed development, as long as the development meets the zoning requirements, it's typically approved. So, but I'm not a one, I'm not a one issue candidate. Uh, I have a proposal to reduce congestion on Colorado Boulevard and on East Colfax. We need to address our homeless population and crime stopping ability, arts and culture. Um, anyway, I sincerely want your vote. My name is Steve Replin. Uh, I'm running for City Council District 5. Thank you, Mrs. Sawyer. Well, thanks so much. I'm Amanda Sawyer, and thanks so much for having us today. This is a really great opportunity to get out and introduce ourselves and our platform to the community, so thanks for that. Um, like I said, I'm Amanda Sawyer. I'm also running for Denver City Council in District 5. Um, I have not been in uh, Colorado for you know my entire life. I'm not a native. I've only been here since 1989. I've lived off and on in a number of different cities in the state. And my husband and I moved home a little bit over three years ago because our oldest daughter is on the autism spectrum. And when we found out, we knew we needed to come home and be sort of around the, our family and friends and have that support. So um, that's what brought us home a few years ago. We're so grateful to be here. Um, and we absolutely love it here. But I am you know, one of those candidates who never really intended to do this. I found out about a development that was going on up the street from my house and when I started asking how and why and who and what this looks like, what I found um, is really that the people who live in our neighborhoods are not 
being heard anymore, that we are, we're really cut out of the process. There's sort of a big machine going on downtown. And whether that is perceived or real, it is the way people feel in our neighborhoods. Um, so I'm really running on three things. The first is to bring the voice of the people in our communities back to this process. The second is to look at crime and safety in our neighborhoods and figure out how we can reallocate resources um, to make sure that we are, are safe. Oh, am, am, I, am I done? Do I have one more minute? Okay. Um, and then the third one is transportation infrastructure. So thank you very much, and I, I look forward to your vote. Well, let's get into our main questions. Candidates, question number one, the topic is homelessness. Denver will be voting on Initiative 300. It's an initiative to allow any individual to engage in activities such as resting and sheltering oneself in a non-obstructive manner in an outdoor public place. The Right to Survive initiative is premised on protecting the homeless or the unhoused from city-mandated property seizures and camping bans that leave officers confiscating property in all kinds of weather conditions. Now this is a city authorized police action which leaves the unhoused facing uh, any number of adverse health outcomes including and up to death as we saw in Boulder and which leaves them uh, deprived of their personal property. Do you support 300? If not, or if so, which other areas of our city resources should be mobilized to support our unhoused populations? We'll begin with candidate assessment. Oh. Um, the Thank you. I don't, I don't support I-300, but I do support the unhoused. Um, I just feel like 300 doesn't do a thing for uh, people who are unhoused. We have about 5,000 homeless people now in our city. And our city needs to do a better job of creating shelters where partners can be with you, where uh, your pets can be with you. But more than that, we need, we need to double down our efforts on our policy of housing first. We have been able to put a great deal of money into housing in the past four years for the homeless, transitional housing. Proud to say that Lowry at one time had more transitional housing than um, any other neighborhood in the city. Um, and we, uh, we do have a dedicated fund now. Uh, if you can get somebody who is unhoused into a home first, provide them some stability, and then wrap around the services, mental health services, addiction services, including job training, um, job seeking, uh, you have a much better uh, uh, lack of recidivism rate. You keep them from being unhoused again. So. Um, I'm not, I don't think that 300 is, gonna, is, is going to help us at all. It's absolutely correct that the police were, when they had to sweep the uh, sidewalks because they needed to be cleaned, they, um, they were taking, when people weren't there to claim their, their stuff, uh, they were taking them to um, a shelter place, and now we have an agreement that, that is going to protect their goods. Um, when they have to sweep the sidewalks clean. Thank you. Rebuttal. Or concurrence. Is that for either of you? Oh. Either of us? I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I just am a little oh, bit confused about confused yeah how well. to, how <laughs> it works. So yes. Um, I agree that 300 is not the answer. Unfortunately, I wish that it were an easy answer, but it isn't. Um, you know that said. I think we can all agree that the homeless sweeps and our camping ban is extremely disturbing, especially in the way that it has been, um, that it has been, that it has gone on and has happened in our community. Um, and so my concern is that, you know, absolutely I do not support 300, I will not be voting for 300, but my concern is what do we do? Because we need to house our homeless population, and we need to make sure that we are providing them um, with the supports that they need to get back on their feet. But the city, to this point, in my opinion, simply has not managed that process well. It has been extremely ugly. It has led to some really disturbing stories and some disturbing trends. Uh, and, and that I find very concerning. And, and I think that that's you know, something we need to consider moving forward. Thank you. Thanks. Is this also our response to the question? Or this is your response. Re Unless you had something to rebut or concur. Other okay. than that, it will be your well, response. I am absolutely against Prop 300. And I think that the, the thing that when the homeless issue is, is reviewed and analyzed, I think the mistake we make is to assume that it is a Denver problem. I think there are homeless people throughout the metro area. 
And if we come up with a solution that's good, then homeless populations from other locations are going to end up coming to Denver to take advantage of our great resolutions. And not that that's not humane and wonderful. But I can see that if Proposition 300 passed, we would start to have permanent camps in City Park, for example, where you have thousands of people in tents that are institutionalized, not in a bad way, but I mean, they, they live there then. So what does that mean about our parks? Do they need their own zip code at a certain point? I mean, do we have to supply utilities? Um, it's a, and and how, do you, how do you move them through a process? If I may, uh, Denver Homeless Out Loud is one of the premier advocacy organizations for the unhoused community. Mm -hmm. uh, they've pointed out that we don't have nearly enough shelters for the folks that are there. And in fact, the ones that exist have uh, oftentimes many limitations around possessions, meaning people have to dispose of their items and, and other things, no pets, no kids, separations, etc. What I've heard is a lot of no, but I haven't heard a solution that works now. Because right now, what the police are doing at the city's behest is pushing homeless people out of our communities. The idea that they're gonna set up permanent encampments is patently false, right? They're not gonna do that because it actually says that it can be non-obstructive. What's the immediate solution to support these people instead of saying that's not the answer because and then proposing things down the road? Well, I, I, that's a great question. Um, and I think that where the Denver Homeless Out Loud's impetus to 4300 really has been experiencing homelessness themselves and experiencing this significantly concerning problem with the treatment of the city. Um, but I think what you're saying is that there is not, the product does not match the need, right? So what we are offering our homeless community is not what we need to be offering them. And I think that most people if you talk to, that you talk to who work with the homeless regularly would agree with that and would agree that, that what, need, what needs to immediately happen is more supports to be able to identify exactly what the needs are of the people experiencing homelessness, whether it be more beds in a, in a family shelter, whether it be animal, you know, a beds in a shelter that allows animal, whether it be support services around addiction services, whether a three strikes and you're out policy is the appropriate choice for um, someone who's experiencing um, addiction and has been asked to leave a shelter for whatever reason. Um, there are solutions here, but it's a funding issue and it's a political will issue and that's what needs to be addressed immediately. And I think that means at this point, perhaps we shouldn't push people off sidewalks when they have nowhere else to go. Let's move on to the next question. Excellent. Next topic on racial inequality. So. Colorado has had the most extensive KKK networks, the Ku Klux Klan, uh, west of the Mississippi through the 1930s. The grandson of one ran for governor this past year. One neighborhood and the airport are named after him, uh, Stapleton. Educational equality has failed children of color based on zip code. Gentrification continues unabated. According to the Denver Gentrification Study of 2016, gentrification is premised on the view of space as profit margin, not community. The Colorado Trust tied historic segregation and modern uh, gentrification. Colorado is third in the nation for white supremacist propaganda and white terrorist right-wing violence are the biggest threat to Americans, yet people of color suffer the brunt of policing. What are your thoughts on racial equality and equity and how will you work to move your district and by extension Colorado towards a more e equal and equitable future? Let's start with you first. Having been on the Board of Governors of the Anti-Defamation League, the Rocky Mountain Region, um, we are the organization that is the recipient of many of the um, claims of discrimination and you know, uh, defamatory incidents. And I think that they have bumped up dramatically, of course, in the recent year or two. Um, who knows why? It could be because of national feeling. But the educational process that's going on in our schools as the result of the Anti-Defamation League's programs, uh, the No Hate programs that are now in elementary schools almost everywhere, and the education of the local law enforcement officers about how to deal with these issues is resulting in an awful lot of progress towards a resolution of those issues. I don't think you can look back to the 1930s to extrapolate about what's going on here because I think, you know, starting probably in my generation and moving forward, 
I'm not really sure that Denver has been that racially upset a city. I don't know if these are people that are coming into the city or they are just feeling more of their own strength to, to paint swastikas, for example, on synagogues and in garage doors. I think the education is the, is the key here. Excellent. Anybody have a rebuttal yeah, or comments? I, I think that our city still has segregation. I think that we still have communities that are pre uh, predominantly of one ethnic group or another. In some ways, that makes uh, gentrification even a more serious problem. Certainly, we don't want to have them move out. We want to uh, make these communities better for the people that live there. And for these communities, they do want to keep the culture that they have produced, though they were, had been segregated before. We have to be careful not to take away the culture that these neighborhoods have uh, provided. I think that uh, racism, ethnicism, sexism, um, anti-Semitism are, uh, just have been around forever. They feel a little bit more present, I think, among us because of social media and people can say some awful things on social media. But um, just read an article that we really haven't gotten back to, uh, have not ever really gotten over segregation after the Civil War. We just never have. Thank you. Um, well, I actually did participate in, in a police ride along because I wanted to find out a little bit more about what this looks like from all different perspectives. And what I learned is that our police districts are huge and our police are understaffed. And what that does is it creates a situation where um, things can happen, right? Where, as particularly in communities of color, you find situations where, you know, people are, are injured or killed because of a mistake that should never have happened. And it's incredibly upsetting, right? What, what I think should be done, what would make a lot of sense, and what I believe the police are working really hard to do right now, is to focus on specific precincts and make sure that the same officers are staffing those smaller areas um, to try and get to know the community members there because I think they need to know who lives there and that will help some of these problems. Excellent. Yeah, I know it was uh, District 9 that uh, just made national news yeah. on the 1600 block of Fillmore with uh, the graffiti that had been uh, yeah. put on somebody's house and the, the uh, occupants had decided not to remove it in order to send a message out to the community that yes. this type of action would not be tolerated. So I'm hoping your district has not seen uh, such vandalism. We have been very lucky in our district, mm -hmm. but District 9 has had problems. District 6 had a problem at Ellis Elementary School just last week. We have a, we, we've been victims of that for anti-Semitism yeah. in the years before that you had arrived here. That it, it happens. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, okay. I've, been here, yeah. I've been here seven years. No, I was years. talking about Amanda. Oh. It's, 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 we've had, we've had uh, yeah, yeah. and so you know what I'm talking about. I do we know have, exactly what We have had anti-Semitism uh, signs and things in our really? district. Yes. And we have so many synagogues mm -hmm. because there are areas of District 5 that are um, populated by, you know, people of Jewish religion more. So it's probably a bit more natural that we would have those incidents in our neighborhoods. It's a real, you know, it's a real issue to keep, to keep watch on. And I don't know that those incidents are representative of how the general population thinks. And, you know, let us keep hope that they're isolated and, you know, they're not indicative of broader racial discrimination. I remember reading, in, reading when in, in college, I studied sociology, Colorado is one of the hottest places for paramilitary organizations and that our mountains have got more uh, sort of s small cells of paramilitary organizations because they can hide very well. Um, so it's not surprising that we are also one of the hot spots for um, racism and other things in the, in the state. Let's move on to our third question on sexual and domestic violence. April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. One in five women and one in 71 men in the United States have been raped at some time in their lives. 42% of victims experienced their first completed rape before the age of 18. A 2016 survey found that 28% of CU Boulder's female undergrads had been sexually assaulted. CU is currently in the news for, 
its most recent rape. Denver's DA, Beth McCann, was found in 2018 to have prosecuted 33% of uh, rape cases charged, a small improvement over her predecessor's average of 30%. The Denver Post rape tracker shows that Denver has had uh, 122 rapes reported so far this year, uh, an average of 38.2 per month or 1.3 per day. The most rapes any neighborhood in Denver has had is five points with nine. Uh, the number of rapes per neighborhood this year is 1.56. How will you use your seat on the council to address these issues and make Colorado a safer place for women and female identified bodies? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the first thing we need to mention here is that, that those statistics do not discuss the people who did not report, which is a real problem because the, I, I don't know, statistically speaking, how many that might be, but there is an incredibly large amount of people who have experienced sexual violence who have not reported it because of the way um, we victim shame. And that's, that is probably the single biggest thing that we can do differently. I actually work with a nonprofit organization um, that it's called uh, Sungate Kids, and they work with, um, it's in down south, and they work with the police and the DA to, for, to sit down and work through, um, especially with minors of um, victims of sexual abuse. And they work very hard to make sure that there are support staff there, emotional supports, so that when this, these children report, they can um, only have to do it once, that it's recorded properly, that the proper people are there to make sure that they are supported so that these rapists can be um, put behind bars where they belong and the, the, the emotional impact is as, as, as the, the, the person who is impacted is, is as supported as possible. And that's what we need to do in our community. I'm going to assume that, are you finished? Yeah. Yes, good. I'm going to assume you're finished. <laughs> Fair. Um, <laughs> I'm going to assume that the reason the DA may not prosecute all of the cases is because the evidence is iffy or the facts don't lend themselves to a conviction. Because DAs are pretty, as a rule, pretty on top of prosecuting crimes that they can, that they can convict on. So does that prompt us to take a look at the laws surrounding rape and to make sure that they're not written in ambiguous ways and that the laws, uh, as they're written, need to be, you know, do they need to be amended to make for an easier path towards conviction? Um, that would be something that I would love to spend some time to jump into. I haven't done that, but clearly it's a problem not just in District 5, but throughout the city. I think the rape statistics are, are just alarming, uh, and even more alarming that we, of course, just the most recent thing with the Me Too mo movement, it's not just how many women are raped, but how many women have experienced some kind of sexual assault on the job, in, at work, uh, wherever. Um, and one of the first things I always like to ask is, what are the men going to do about it? Um, uh, a lot of times it is left to the woman to do something about it. And so one of the big questions I always have is, what are the men going to uh, do to help their uh, gender uh, realize that what, what is proper and what is not proper? What the city can do, uh, we don't have jurisdiction over the district attorney, but we certainly can uh, tell, talk to the district attorney and say, we want these cases um, looked into and handled uh, to make sure that we um, handle them as much as possible and encourage young women to speak out and to encourage young men to speak out. I think you bring up a terrific point. Uh, in fact, the state is debating right now whether consent should be a mandatory part of sex ed. Um, it's looking like it's going to become a mandatory yes. part of sex ed, yep. but at the same time, sex ed isn't required in our schools, I know. which means schools can opt out, especially in conservative districts like Weld County. Uh, for example, I live alongside Weld County, and mm -hmm. that's happening there. Um, another interesting point is uh, that the DA does do their best, but evidence is often shaky. And it might not be the laws. When I worked at the Blue Bench, the major issue that we talked about there was uh, the failures of the police department to believe women. And instead asking questions like, what were you doing at that party? 
Why were you there in the first place? Why were you dressed that way? Right. Mm -hmm. There's even a a movement right now called Start by Believing. Mm -hmm. Right? So. Right. Right. Because victim shaming is the single biggest reason why people will not report. So I guess a follow-up question would be, since we're talking about a state issue, for the city of Denver, would you vote for mandatory consent sexual education? Absolutely. A complete uh, sex education that is really truthful and complete for everybody. It, um, you know, just because you teach them about, about sex doesn't mean they're going to go out and do it. But it seems so crazy that we don't teach them about sex. Uh, we don't. We, we teach them about lions and tigers, but they don't become lions and tigers. Um, so yes, we should have a complete and thorough uh, uh, explanation in, in our sex education. And I would completely agree with that for sure. It's the kind of a, you know, it's a topic that's so difficult to talk about. Likely uh, for kids to sit through and for teachers to teach, and then for officers to enforce, and then for, you know folks thereafter to prosecute and gather evidence, that it really needs to start at the most basic level. And I think everybody needs that education, most especially those folks who are prone to come into contact with these women who have these, these issues. Yeah, I agree as well. Um, but I think that, this, that the issue of teaching consent is so much broader than sex education because where that is where we're discussing it now and that is what is incredibly important with the conversation we're having at this moment. When I, I'm a, the parent of three elementary school kids, so I, I live it every day, right? When we're talking about bullying on the playground, when we're talking, you know, the, the, the discussion of consent and consensual touching, it, is, it, it, it's broader than just sex education in schools. It is more useful for children in other areas of their life to understand it and it's incredibly important. We're talking about it right now in terms of sex ed because that's what the hot button issue is at the state at this moment, but it's so much broader than that. Mm -hmm. And it's really important that the kids learn those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And I think as people get older, it's a very confusing topic because you have, for example, the Joe Biden issue of you know, just putting his hands on someone's shoulder and kissing them on the back of the head or whatever he did, I don't know exactly. But you know, as those issues become more broadly known and condemned, where is the line? I think, I think men are confused. They you really are. I right? heard a great saying for men that don't say or do anything to uh, another person that you wouldn't want your cellmate to do to you. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Oh, uh, that's right. 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 It's just keep right. right? I mean, Push that in, yes. But right. you know what it does? Know. Don't say or do anything. Yeah. You wouldn't, <laughs> you want, wouldn't your want your cellmate, cellmate to do to you. Oh, that's so funny. Yep. <laughs> but you know the other like half kiss of the it back is, of your head. <laughs> oh, God, that's for sure. Um, I don't know if we're out of time, but just a real quick uh, comment about that that I heard on a talk show recently was that in the last week or two is that Biden has apologized profusely in every way he knows how to. And so have the various and sundry men who've been accused of these things over the last couple of years. And yet their apologies don't ever seem to be enough. And so I think it's another reason that men get confused. I mean, okay, so I'm not perfect. And I put my hand on somebody's shoulder, you know, I'm sorry. You know, if it's a, it's, if it's a violation of a boundary, which it could well be and probably is most of the time, I suppose, um, whoops, I'm sorry. But there's no, there's no opportunity to be, um, to be given another chance. It's just, you did it, you're wrong, you bad guy, go to the cell, and let's see what your cellmate does. That's so funny. Very and funny. I actually disagree but, with you um, in that I think okay. that it is, um, as, as the, these opportunities have come up as these stories have come up. There are, right, I mean, it's very difficult to determine what the truth is and, and the Always. media has blown things out of proportion. Of so I say that, you know, with a, with a deep grain of salt. But, you know, consensual touching is pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. I, right. I think it's, it, it's very easy to turn around and say, that made me uncomfortable. Please don't do that. Um, and so, you know, there are a lot of other issues here. I don't think it is as black and white or as simple as, you know, apologizing and moving forward. I, I just, I think there's power structure issues that need to be discussed here. I think there are, you know, um, job and, and, and 
you know, future earnings concerns that need to be discussed here. I think that this is a topic that can't be, you know, distilled down into a minute of response. Um, but I do disagree with you on it being as simple as as just an apology and moving forward. But see, I don't I don't agree with you. Because <laughs> in a workspace context, somebody's in front of you at the water fountain and you know, maybe you work with her as a guy's perspective, and you say, uh, Dorothy, are you uh, gonna spend two hours at the drinking fountain? And that was a touch just as a friendship gesture, right? As a gesture of friendliness. Did that invade her space in a way that would cause a normal person to feel uncomfortable? I don't know. And if it does, and you say, whoops, I'm sorry, are you saying that the mere apology is not sufficient to make up for the universe of women who are being, you know, I mean, it's, yeah, it's no, it's a great question. It's a great question. Replin, I'm gonna go ahead and stop you right there. Oh. Um, it, it seems to me like a subtle amount of gaslighting. And I will say that because uh, tapping somebody on the shoulder to get past them to get water is not the same thing as leaving your hand lingering on their shoulder long enough to yeah. make them uncomfortable. So that was just about to what, say. What, Vice President, former Vice President Biden did is a long history of uncomfortable touches that Jon Stewart, when he was hosting The Daily Show, skewered, skewered on air because it was uncomfortable, right? He called it the audacity of growth. <laughs> did anybody object when, when Biden did those things? I'm sure some people did, but or did that come out later? I mean, what, you see a mind it's reader? It's also what Ms. Sawyer said, anything. which is about uh, quid pro quo. This is a man that has power, that's uh, leveraging that power, how do you tell him no? How do you make it uncomfortable in that situation? We have to start by believing, trust women, and Joe Biden is not gonna go to prison. Asking him to apologize sincerely and stop is not a lot to ask. And with that. Next question. <laughs> next question. So uh, community wellness likes to talk about uh, Denver Public Health. And so um, just to start, District 5 life expectancy is about 80 years, uh, 2.3 years longer than Denver overall. Uh, congratulations. 14% of District 5 young adults use tobacco, 3% lower than Denver overall, 10% of public school children in District 5 uh, neighborhoods are obese, 6% lower than Denver overall, 13% of District 5 adults have been diagnosed with depression, which is common all across the districts in Denver. Denver.gov states that the health of a community depends on more than access to health care. Healthy communities are composed of a physical environment, healthy opportunities, support, and where individuals easily connect with community partners, health food systems, and safe environments. Increased access to these systems allows individuals of a healthy community to thrive. Do you believe that District 5 is serving its community equitably, equitably in these areas? And if not, what would you do to address disparities in your district? I think we're serving a part of our district very, very well. Um, it's very true that it's not just about health, but it is access to healthy foods, access to exercise and information about your health. And part of our district um, has a lot of that access. In fact, I've often called ourselves a grocery oasis instead of a grocery desert. But the uh, northern part of our district, which is uh, mostly e uh, East Colfax, is a completely different story. East Colfax is the lowest income, lowest education, highest unemployment neighborhood in the city. We have that neighborhood and we also have uh, the wealthiest neighborhood in the city. And there are, are distinct differences between them, which is why I have spent so much of my uh, energies on uh, trying to revitalize Colfax and bring them into a healthier neighborhood, find uh, grocery stores, find uh, access to healthy um, habits, um, and uh, hope to continue to do so. Uh, so that they, we can equalize the access that people have. In this whole city, I think we need to equalize the access to healthy habits and healthy um, avenues. Absolutely. So Ruffin. District 5 is not homogenous, as Mary Beth suggests also. And therefore, if you take a look at you know, the incidence of obesity, for example, and life expectancy, Likely you're taking a look at the center corridor of our district, which includes a more educated group of folks and people who are probably in uh, jobs and or entrepreneurial ventures where their incomes are not as tenuous as the folks who live probably from 13th Avenue to Colfax, you know, maybe from Holly all the way up to, uh, to uh, Aurora. Because those are the lesser educated 
And those are really where the emphasis needs to be put. Um, you can't just broad brush District 5 with you know, one solution or another because the needs are very, very different. Excellent. I agree um, with everything that's been said to this point. I think that's exactly right. There are vast differences in District 5. Um, and what we need to do is make sure that we are addressing the neighborhoods that need you know, different things in different ways. Um, and that is absolutely true. We also need to make sure that we are addressing the citywide needs as a council person. And that includes not only access to things like grocery stores in places like Montbello and, and you know, Green Valley Ranch, but also things like, are we going to allow fracking in Denver? And absolutely not as far as I'm concerned. Are we you know, going to clean up our rivers? Are we going to make sure that the people in Elyria and Swansea and those areas are living equally as long as the people who are lucky enough to you know, live in the wealthiest neighborhood in the city? And if they aren't, why aren't they? Right, I think, unfortunately, we know the answer to that question. It was sort of rhetorical. Um, and so those are the kinds of things um, that we need to look at, not only in District 5, but on the citywide level as well. Excellent. I think, Mr. Ripplin, you brought it up in your introduction, talking about the uh, congestion along Colorado Boulevard. And I think all of you will have an, an opinion on this issue. But when we talk about air quality and the, the traffic that we see on Colfax and Colorado Boulevard, uh, the, the city is vastly understated uh, the, the air quality. As a matter of fact, back, I believe it was in February, we had air quality that equated to something that they would expect in parts of China. And so what are we, you had mentioned that you had uh, a solution to the traffic on Colorado Boulevard. And I would love to hear your opinions on uh, what we could do to, to mitigate the damage that the, that the cars are causing to the residential areas that are on those streets. I'll start with you, Mr. Ruffin. Good, thank you. I would suggest that traffic does not come from the traffic ferry, all right? It doesn't just drop onto Colorado Boulevard and it wasn't there yesterday, but it is today. So what causes traffic? People in cars going hither and yon. And why are those people in their cars on Colorado Boulevard? Because they live in the area and they make trips to their job, to the grocery store, to the schools, whatever it happens to be. So I believe that traffic is a symptom, not the disease. The disease is the development because it brings more and more and more and more, did I say more? And more people into what is a landlocked city. If you look at it from the perspective of the city at large, there just isn't any place to grow except vertically. But the city was never developed to handle the, the infrastructure and road size and so on and so forth. The traffic, the utilities, the air quality, as you suggest, the mass transportation needs. I mean, I wonder how long it now takes a bus to get from I-25 on Colorado Boulevard to Colfax. I mean, you could almost walk faster, I would bet. So, that impacts whether mass transportation is going to be something that people really find to be desirable. Can't move. Absolutely. Rebuttal, concurrence? Uh, I, I've probably spent most of my time working on our mo mobil mobility issue in, uh, in Denver. And I was, have been successful in getting the mayor to uh, think about creating Denver's own transportation department so we can take ownership of our transit needs. We have to uh, reduce our car use as much as possible. We have a built environment. We can't increase the size of our roads. And even if we did, when you increase the size of a road, you increase the traffic. Um, density is one of the ways in which you can get rid of traffic, or at least get rid of people having to use single occupancy cars. Um, it, because you, if, particularly if you make walkable communities where people can walk some, to some things they do every day. If we do not build place, we have a thousand people a month coming into Denver. If we do not build um, for those people, they will move to the suburbs, which will increase our traffic exponentially. Uh, there are some solutions for Colorado Boulevard. I kind of want a gondola, but I, they always laugh at me when I say that. But we could have bus uh, rapid transit lanes um, in all of those major streets. I guess I over talked to myself. Okay, I. this is a very, important topic to it me. It is, it's critical. Yeah, I think it's critical to everyone in District 5 because 
this is really one of the, the hot button issues that have caused people to be incredibly frustrated in our district and to feel um, like their quality of life is at, at risk and, and, and is being compromised. And it's because there is not clean, safe, reliable public transit t that takes you where you wanna go, right? And it's not just about buses, but also bike lanes, which have to be protected or people won't use them because they will be injured or die or, you know, on, on biking to work. Um, it needs to be about all kinds of different transit options. You know, there are areas of the city where there are no sidewalks at all. And so asking people to walk down the middle of the street or imagine what that looks like for someone who is in a wheelchair, right? It's incredibly um, important that we start looking at this. And without a dedicated source of funding, there is no answer because it, it will be entirely left to the whim of who, the mayor, whoever that might be. Um, in the annual budget, which is what's happening right now. And we've got to change that. Thank you, Ms. Sorry. Let's go on to our next question. Uh, final question before we move into the lightning round is on local media, uh, a topic near our hearts as media professionals. Media is in crisis in Colorado. Denver Open Media is under attack as the mayor has worked to defund this important project and remove equipment. The Denver Post uh, and the Daily Camera, our region's only two major print newspapers, are owned by hedge funds. Uh, who are busy extracting capital and laying off staff. Some of that staff actually started the Colorado Sun. Uh, fake news is the slur of the day, courtesy of our current administration. How do we support uh, our local newspapers, community journalism, and organizations like Denver Open Media that work to be a pillar of community information and provide equal access to everyone? I think we're at Ms. Is Sawyer. It, should I start? Yes, That's please. Great. Yeah, um, you know, I, I think this is a great question because when I walked in here today, I had no idea um, that even this facility was at risk. Um, that, and I didn't understand the reasons behind why it is that um, this, you know, the 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 way that this has been set up has been completely changed over the last eight years. Um, and I don't, I still don't, I'm, I still don't really understand exactly a hundred percent what on earth happened here to make that. Um, you know, to make this a place that is potentially gonna close. Um, and that's really concerning. So part of it, I really think, is educating the population of people, myself included, I'm ashamed to say, that um, had no idea the true uh, peril that our media is in. And so I think making that voice louder and and making people truly understand what is happening here and what is at stake here um, is something that we should really work to do a better job of doing. Um, and I'm glad that I learned, I had the opportunity to learn about it today because I, I'm sorry I did not know more before I walked in here today. Thank you. Mr. Rufflin? Um, I actually have had the privilege of being on the board of directors of the Denver Open Media Foundation now for a couple of years. And so I'm very, very sensitive and aware of the problems that face this wonderful institution. Uh, it's nonprofit, it's funded primarily by the city, and the city is doing something that is just unfathomable to the executive director here and all of us on the board, which is defunding us um, and taking the promised funds that they had allocated to us before away and it is a community resource when it's operating on all cylinders that was beautiful and helped kids learn because a real integral component of this was an educational facility that's back someplace here in one of the rooms. And uh, there's a radio station that's affiliated, KBO, and it is just an incredibly valuable resource. Now, the question of what to do in five seconds, I don't know the answer. Oh. But I sure would love to spend some time to uncover the various alternatives. Excellent. Yeah, you asked a very important question, I think, for the day, is what do we do about media and what do we do about uh, media that's thoughtful and um, accessible? There's so much media, and so people can put on the social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, so many things that it may not be factual, so you need to uh, support and retain the uh, media sources that use professional work to, to, uh, uh, who uh, have the journalistic code of ethics, 
Um, I certainly still subscribe to the Denver Post and hope that they live long um, and would like to see print media come back, but that might be my generation. Um, I, I did work to help um, open media because I, this has been a, um, a, a sort of a favorite project of mine as well. Um, it's complicated, and I could explain to y'all folks, you know, it's very complicated what happened. Um, but uh, certainly have been a big supporter of open media and just community access is very important, especially when they can come in and get uh, help from professional people who know something about uh, journalism and, and media that's um, ethical. Thank you. Um, just to follow up on that, when, when um, the hedge fund that owns the Denver Post fired their editor-in-chief, the editorial team was able to submit an editorial into the newspaper that uh, condemned the selling off of the newspaper to a hedge fund uh, and the vulture nature of that hedge fund's uh, operations. Uh, same hedge fund owns a daily camera in Boulder. I think it's the same hedge fund. I'm not 100% sure. There's two that are very big. Um, their editor-in-chief, Dave Krieger, attempted to submit a similar editorial was told no, so he published it on his own, separate, outside of the organization, and was fired for it. Um, some communities have struggled with threats against journalists. Maryland uh, saw an attack because of right-wing paranoia inflamed by the President of the United States, calling, uh, calling media professionals the enemy of the people. Some cities have floated the idea of a local tax to help support public media, uh, public newspapers specifically, to make sure that they aren't decimated, uh, as, as we're witnessing here in, uh, in Denver. Would you all support a poll tax or any other sort of, not a poll tax, what am I talking about? Would you all support a local tax or <laughs> any other sort of? Uh, yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's a good question. Um, I, I, it is one of many, many, major issues that are facing the city and the state of Colorado right now. Um, and m my short answer and what my heart wants to tell you is absolutely because we need media that is safe, that is, um, you know, that does not have ties to anything or anyone. But at the same time, um, you know, we need to be very careful that the cost of living here has already gotten so high and our wages have not kept up with that. We also need to be careful that we aren't simply going back to the well and adding tax, 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 just, um, you know, because we need to be careful, particularly sales tax, which has been shown to be regressive. We need to make sure that we're very thoughtful about how we do that, only just because we, we've got to make sure that we stop pushing out the people who can no longer afford to live here because our wages haven't kept up with you know, what it costs to live here these days. Excellent. So it's a tough one. Please. Just a quick PS to that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that one of the issues might be non-local ownership. Because when you get a hedge fund out of New York City, they're really looking at it from the standpoint of the bottom line. Whereas local ownership would be much more concerned about the quality of the news, the accuracy of the reporting, the quality of the staff, um, as a lawyer, I represent um, a client who owns two newspapers in northern Colorado, uh, in Fort Collins and the surrounding, and his business is going crazy because he's there. He knows what people are talking about. He knows what the news is that needs to be um, you know, put out in his newspapers, and he's really successful. So I, I'm not sure that it really takes a tax. I think it takes somebody who's got a buy-in for the success of the paper, because it's really, it's kind of like a public utility in a, mm -hmm. in a sense. You know, it shouldn't, everything shouldn't be run for profit. Right. And a newspaper might be one of those, I don't know. Excellent, well, we're gonna have to move on to the oh. lightning round, so I apologize, okay. we'd love to uh, take more time to uh, go through that, just to explain again, uh, this is a candidate's favorite opportunity, the lightning round, because they get no chance to explain <laughs> their answer. Uh, Perfect. <laughs> Can we pass? No, sadly, uh, you'll have to pass. give a yes or no. Pass. So the questions will be in a, a general yes or four. 
or no and against. Okay. So as uh, each of us ask a question, you get your answer, and then we'll move on to the next question. So we'll go, let's start down here. Uh, so question number one, Denver is unveiling a new transportation department to supersede RTD in the city, for or against? For. 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 Excellent. Great cities around the world are going green. Denver is home to the nation's most polluted zip code. Transition Denver to fully renewables by 2030 or sooner, yes or no? Yes. No. Yes. Denver is voting on decriminalizing mushrooms. The Psilocybin Initiative 301 to decriminalize mushrooms, yes or no? Uh, yes, no. I don't know, understand. Uh, do you support, do uh, I support? No, I Article don't support. Article 301? No. Absolutely not. Decriminalizing? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Uh, State Representative Julie Gonzalez has proposed removing the ban against rent control, rent control to allow cities to decide for themselves what works best to support lower income renters. If the ban removal passes, would you support, support rent control in Denver, yes or no? Yes. 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 Do you support deferred action for the childhood arrivals, otherwise known as DACA, yes or no? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. The Olympics initiative prohibiting the use of public monies, resources, or fiscal guarantees in connection with any future Olympic Games without the city first obtaining voter approval, for or against? For. For. Against for lots of worrisome reasons. April 10th was Equal Pay Day. The Equal Pay for Equal Work Act was recently heard in committee. Do you support a law to ensure equal pay, yes or no? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Ban fracking in Colorado, yes or no? No, not in all of Colorado. In Colorado. No. No, not all Colorado. Not all of Colorado, but Denver, yes. The age old question, whole countries have gone to war over this. Chocolate or vanilla? Chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> vanilla. Vanilla. <laughs> Vanilla's have it. Yep. And finally, ending with some <laughs> important <laughs> geopolitical intrigue. Are you excited for this ninth season of Game of Thrones? <laughs> I, I might be the only person in the world who's never watched. You never watched Game an episode? Of Thrones. I've never All watched right, you're it. Out. <laughs> I've never watched an episode either. Uh, oh, well, then there's two yes. of us. Yes. Yeah, okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Excellent. Uh, we're right now, we have time. If you would, just uh, share a minute and a half of closing remarks uh, with our audience. So let's start over here. Um, thank you very much. I am very pleased to be running again um, and, and honor my uh, uh, contenders here for putting themselves out as well. Um, I uh, uh, hope to have your vote. Um, I want to continue the work that we are doing on creating better transportation opportunities, bikes, sidewalks, everything, creating a transportation department. I want to continue the work on East Colfax for redevelopment, revitalization, restore that place to its main street glory. Um, and look forward to uh, continuing the work that we started. Thank you. Thank you. I think you can see that there are some differences of opinion between us, which I think is very healthy. And the, the issues we face are not easy to resolve, by and large. Uh, but as a lawyer, a business coach, a negotiator, an entrepreneur, I know the power of sitting down with people to understand a point of view and an opposing point of view and how to bring people together so that the ultimate conclusion is something that everybody can live with and maybe not everybody is jumping up and down about. So when I see the governmental processes of committees and meetings and studies about things that might be more resolvable in different ways, I get really aggravated. So I think that I can add a substantial amount of creativity to the process and the ultimate resolution of the issues we face both in District 5 as well as in the city at large just because of the background I have and the experience I have, which is decades, of creatively solving problems for clients, making solutions that everybody can live with. Um, I've worked with budgets, cash flows, accountability. I'm a CPA also. And so the issues that require oversight in this city and creative thinking, all of which are things I have dealt with in the past, and um, especially the runaway construction. Because once a building is built, it can't be unbuilt. 
So the okay. prospect of approving something, you know, a building project, a project to go someplace, is not just does it fit the zoning requirement. It's not just about that. So I ask for your vote. Uh, on May the 7th, Steve Replin for District 5. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Um, well, thanks again for having us. This was a really great opportunity. I'm glad that we got to talk about some of these bigger civil rights issues because so much of what we talk about in District 5 is related to traffic and development because those are the real issues that people are very, very concerned about um, when it comes to their daily lives in living in District 5. Um, and so, you know, as an attorney and as an MBA, I've got the qualifications. Um, and as an entrepreneur, um, you know, and with a background in sales and marketing, I've got the education and the business experience to be able to do this job. But most importantly, I have the experience of already being out there advocating for our neighbors in different ways, advocating for crosswalks, advocating against development that didn't make sense, um, you know, working with different areas of both the city and the neighbors, um, re registered neighborhood organizations, and just the regular people who live in our neighborhoods. And as a parent in, with three kids in DPS, I'm there all the time. I jokingly say I never leave District 5 because I literally have like a one mile radius that my whole sort of life right now revolves around with my family. Um, and so that gives me the ability to really understand and empathize with the um, you know, experience of living in District 5. And so I hope that people will take that into account and vote for me, Amanda Sawyer, on May 7th or before ballots came out today. Yes. Yesterday, they arrived today. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you all. And we would love to thank you for coming down here, having this conversation and participating in Denver City Council No BS Debate for District 5. On behalf of Denver Open Media, the Open Media Foundation and Civic Matters, my name is De La Vaca. Chris Ward. Thank you for listening and tuning in. Have a good day and don't forget to vote on May, th May 7th.